everyone. Welcome inside the home office. I'm Craig D'Amico, and this is the latest edition of NEC Now on the NEC Overtime Pod. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by the head women's basketball coach of Mount St. Mary's, Maria Marquezano. Maria, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, for sure, Craig. Thanks for having me. Now, the, the last time we talked prior to today, we were getting ready for a semifinal playoff game, and I think like the next day the world okay. shut down. So in, in the meantime, how have you been, and, and what has this, this time been like for you? I, I trust that everyone's doing well. Yeah, I mean, I, it's so crazy to think about. I, I feel like we've told this story over and over um, to our alumni, to our parents, to just everyone that's been curious about our journey and how that, how that day affected us. I mean, obviously, it was it was a terrible day. Um, it was the news that we didn't want to hear, but we knew it was inevitable as we watched things uh, kind of unfold around uh, around our country. And we saw, you know, the other conference start to shut down, NEC, Big Ten. You know, once we saw that, we knew it was inevitable. But um, like you said, we've just been trying to make the most of, of the situation. You know, I was able to get back and spend some time in the Midwest with my family. Our girls have, have you know, taken advantage of their family time with their families as well. Um, and I think we're all refreshed. And I think the positive that we were able to take from our situation is, you know, we don't lose anybody. So while a lot of teams went through this, um, you know, most teams have now graduated somebody or, or lost people from their team. And we're thankful that we get another, get another shot at it, at it this, this year. Well, we're going to take a deep dive into all that, the team, the season. The, 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 we're going to talk a little bit about that playoff game that never was. And, of course, how the team's been working through some of these uh, unusual circumstances but first I want to I want to highlight on your journey because you talked about getting back home to the Midwest you're, you're from Indiana you're a multi-sport athlete so uh, let's go way back to the beginning how was it uh, when you were a youngster that you fell in love with the game of basketball uh, I think fall in love with the game I was just um, you know I followed my big brother around um, he played basketball baseball tennis football and um, baseball was his biggest sport and, and I was a multiple sport athlete all the way through college and actually uh, played professionally two different sports as well. So um, falling in love was easy, you know, just following my brother around. And then um, getting into coaching was, was a different story. I really never wanted to be a coach. Um, I, didn't <laughs> want to to, I didn't want to have to decide playing time. I, you know, I saw as a college athlete how difficult that was. Um, you know, every kid goes to college with that same dream of um, having a huge role like they had in high school or their travel team. So Coaching for me came a little, you know, that passion came a little bit later, but falling in love with the game was easy and started at a young age. So, so I'm wondering now when you have to decide players uh, playing time and make those kinds of things that you didn't want to do back then, do you like not even think twice about that now? <laughs> I just found that my competitiveness takes over. You know, you, okay. keep, the, you keep the integrity of the program first. Um, you know, you want to win at all costs. And when it comes down to playing time, it, it, it does suck at times, but you know, you've been with those kids through practice, you know, from, from months, you know, July was when we start. So, um, you know, if it's not freshmen, it's sophomores, juniors, seniors, you've been with them so many hours. So, you know, um, you know, where you're at with playing time and, and I'm very transparent and they know where, you know, we as a as staff stand as well, even if those conversations are very uncomfortable and um, are not fun at times. But um, yeah, when it comes down to the game, my competitiveness takes over and it's just time to win. Now, playing high school basketball in the state of Indiana, I mean, they made a whole movie of it. <laughs> Who's your seat? Everyone's seen a million times. Uh, what, what, what is it really like growing up and, and playing in that type of environment? It's just a really big deal. Um, I, you know, I've coached uh, multiple places now and going and recruiting at high school games. It's just different in Indiana. Um, it could be a Tuesday night, a Wednesday night, a Monday night. I mean, the gyms are going to be packed. Um, you're going to have people come from all over the city. You know, we have so many, you know, I'm from Fort Wayne. We have so many high schools just within our city, um, probably up to 20, if not more in the surrounding, um, you know, suburbs. So it's just, you know, exciting. Um, it, it lost a little bit of luster when we went to class basketball. Um, for a long time, we had just one, one state champion. And, you know, since we've gone to the class, it's lost a little bit, but not much. I mean, it's still uh, a really cool experience just, just playing basketball in Indiana in general. Now, how much of those, you'd be a perfect person to ask, how much of those stereotypes from the movie are fact and how much are fake, like, are, you know, shooting, shooting hoops on the side of the barn in the middle of the cornfield and, you know, 20,000 people jam-packed standing room only for the, the high school state finals. I mean, how much of that is, is true and how much of that did they use some creative license? 
Uh, I think in a lot of parts of the states, that's very true. Um, you know, there is a lot of country in Indiana. Now there are some cities, you know, there's Fort Wayne, there's Indianapolis, there's Gary. So we do have some, some bigger cities in Indiana where um, that might not be as accurate. But I do think, you know, you drive through the state of Indiana, you're going to see the hoop on the side of the barns. Um, you're going to see, you know, a lot of playgrounds. I, I always equate it to in Italy. When you're on the train in Italy, you see soccer fields everywhere. In Indiana, you're driving down the road, you see basketball hoops everywhere. Now, you, you, you were at Elmhurst High School, I mm -hmm. believe. At some point here, we're going to throw up, we have a picture from back in high school. We know everybody oh, loves yeah. looking at their high school photos, so we're going to throw that up here. But uh, what, what are some of your, your memories from, from those playing days? Well, unfortunately, my school uh, actually shut down. There's a limestone quarry behind, uh, right behind our school. And I, did, I grew up, my parents still live not far from there. So they blast every day for that limestone. So the more they blasted, the more it tore the building down. And to keep that building, the upkeep became so expensive. So they decided to shut it down and, and the quarry ended up buying them out. But, um, you know, I cherish those memories even more. Um, you know, I had the opportunity to maybe go to another high school that was maybe pro more prominent for, for basketball. But I, I wanted to go to Elmhurst. That's where my siblings had gone. It was right down the street from where I grew up. And um, I had relationships with everyone there. And, you know, we hadn't won much. Um, or the, the program hadn't won much in, in the last couple of years before I got there. And then we made a couple of runs um, my freshman and sophomore years and um, had a lot of fun. And I'll never forget those days. It was um, like you mentioned, the stereotypes. We're making that run in the state tournament and people are leaving signs in my front yard and, you know, cheering us on people that we don't even know. And that's just um, one example of how important basketball is in Indiana. And, and besides the, the high school and college, which obviously gets a huge following, that time, you know, those, those late 90s, early 2000s, you had the Indiana Pacers who were in Eastern Conference Finals. They made the NBA Finals in 2000. You had the Chicago Bulls, the state next door over with Michael Jordan, and then we just had the, the Last Dance documentary. So I, I'm wondering, you know, how much of, of a fever was there for the, for the professional uh, environment when you were growing up? Well, I'm from Fort Wayne, and, and most of the sports that we follow in Fort Wayne are Chicago sports. So I kind of grew up a Bulls fan. I really didn't become a Pacers fan until I lived in Indianapolis playing, playing at Butler. Um, but, you know, that era, like you said, was huge with Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, making all those runs. Um, it definitely had, um, you know, not only a basketball effect, but a cultural effect on, on our area. I mean, it was, you know, following that, those teams and, and, you know, their style and obviously the Air Jordans and all that, that had a huge impact on us. Um, I think just really all over, not just in Indiana, though. Was there anything that you saw on the dock that kind of stood out uh, to you, either that you didn't know or maybe something that just brought back the nostalgia? Yeah, I mean, I, because I was a Bulls fan, I had read a lot of those books and I had, you know, I knew a lot of that Jerry Krause background. Um, you know, you always heard the legends of, of the Dennis Rodman stories, but um, really it was just cool seeing behind the scenes. I think I, that's what I enjoyed the most. Um, I... I thought it was cool the way the other guys respected that MJ had to live a different type of lifestyle. You know, they understood why. I mean, they saw the craziness that surrounded him, but yet they respected him because like he said, he never asked them to do anything that he wouldn't or couldn't do. So um, I, I, just like everyone else, I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun to watch. Now, when we talked a couple months ago, you were saying 2001, that was the last time Mount St. Mary's was in the NEC championship game. You were also a senior in high school and you were going through the recruiting process. So, so tell me a little bit about what that recruiting process was like and your decision to kind of stay in state and, and go to Butler. My process was a little bit crazy. Um, I, I, we had quite a few kids from the Fort Wayne area, females that had gone to Michigan State. And um, after I went through that early recruiting process, I visited a lot of schools, um, probably three or four Big Ten schools, um, schools that were mostly within, you know, four to five hours. And at an early age, I decided I wanted to do that too. I wanted to go to Michigan State. Um, so I had kind of given my verbal commitment or, you know, at, that, at the time, they weren't really calling it that, but I had given my, you know, this is where I want to go and kind of had, was on the same page with that coach. And then she, she retired. And then the new coach came in and brought in, um, you know, her recruits from the East Coast at the time. So I was headed into my senior year all this time. You know, I would go to these workouts and showcases and everyone would like, oh, she's going to Michigan State. She's going to Michigan State. Um, and then I'm heading into my senior year all of a sudden and don't have, you know, don't have a school to go to. And a lot of those offers were gone at that point. You know, they move on to their second choices once you tell them that, you know, you're, you're going somewhere else. So um, 
ended up going to a workout down in Indianapolis and the Butler coach was there and, uh, you know, pretty much built a bond with her right away. Um, and once I saw what a basketball community was, um, I was a pretty good student. So academics were important to me and Butler's a really good academic school. It just seemed like it fit. It was a perfect distance. Um, I had a great visit there, obviously the feel of Hinkle and, and Butler's campus in general. It was just, um, you know, it was a blessing that that came through late in the game. Was, was there, um, you know, the fact that there might, it may have been an opportunity to get involved with softball as well and some of your, your other sport, uh, was that part of the, the process as well? Or was that something that just happened? Not at all. I mean, I had brought that up to just a few coaches, you know, would I ever be able to play both? And almost every single coach was like, at this level, it's, it's really impossible. Um, so I kind of let that dream go um, at an early age and, and knew that, you know, it was going to be basketball. The softball thing came about because um, heading into my senior year, um, the shortstop for the Butler team actually happened to be from Fort Wayne as well. She ends up tearing her elbow and has to have Tommy John surgery. Um, and some of the players on the team had played with me in the All-State game, um, and they knew that I played shortstop and was pretty good. And so they kind of approached me like, hey, we need a shortstop bad this season. Do you think you would be willing to play um, after your season's over? And I was really excited about it at first, but I was like, ah, I haven't trained, you know, I haven't played in almost four years now. Um, so eventually I, I spoke to the softball coach um, and he said, you know, I, I'm for it. If you're for it, he said, I want you to talk to your basketball coach first. Um, you know, talk to her, gave, everyone gave me their blessing. And um, I didn't even play a full season, but I had so much fun in those two months. There was no pressure on me. You know, I, I came out, um, you know, I hadn't trained, so, you know, I wasn't expected to perform, but um, picked back up pretty quick and, and had a really, really good time in those two months. It's like riding a bike, right? Once you, you have it down. <laughs> to some extent, you know, you jump to Division One college softball, the ball is coming at you a little bit harder. Defensively, it did, I mean, it didn't take much to get back into the swing of things. Hitting took, took a second, um, but I, I had a really good season and, and we had a decent season as a team. And like I said, it was a lot of fun to be back outside. You know, you spend so much time inside basketball season and just, um, you know, baseball, softball was always something that kind of came naturally anyways. And it was carefree to just be outside, you know, have fun new experience with a new team. And um, like I said, I had about as much fun in those two months um, as I had had in, in many of the other seasons. Now, you, when you came to Butler basketball, uh, you were the newcomer of the year right out of the shoot. And then there was a coaching change. Coach Kucher comes in and, and the team improves in, in terms of one loss record. Uh, what, what are some of your memories about, you know, playing hoops for, for Butler? Yeah, you know, Coach G, uh, Wendy Gatlin, she had recruited me and then Coach Kucher took over and Obviously, I played for Coach Kucher for three years, so I have a lot more memories with her. Um, you know, I just remember, and this is something I carry with me as a coach, you know, having taken over a couple different programs now, is just how much satisfaction there is in, you know, improving. Um, I remember my first year with her, which was my sophomore year, and I actually was hurt that year, but we, we got to the six win mark. And for some people, that wasn't a lot, but we had doubled our previous seasons wins and you know she kind of taught us at that time you got to celebrate uh the little joys along the way and um it was an uphill battle um we weren't very talented uh we weren't very big we weren't you know athletic compared to other teams but uh we continued to improve each year and by the time I was a senior we were making a little bit of noise in our tournament now I I, I haven't seen tape of you in your playing days, but for just from what I've seen, you know, you still have several three-point shooting records uh, in, in the Butler women's basketball record books. It seems like you were a cool three-point shooter before three-point shooting was cool. Like now in today's game, everybody's making three. So I'm wondering what is, is different from your day um, as far as a three-point shooter's mentality or um, the way it's coached or the way it's taught versus the game and how it's evolved today? I just think the biggest difference is it's so much more emphasized. Obviously, uh, being from Indiana, being a good shooter, um, that was something that I always loved. And I always kick myself because I actually didn't play my sophomore year and then I didn't use my redshirt year. And so some of those records, had I played another year, I, I think I could have <laughs> climbed a little higher. Sometimes I kick myself about that. But um, no, it's definitely more emphasized, obviously, in our game. Um, all the analytics kind of started pointed towards um, the value of that and like you know and everyone else knows it, it's changed our game um, you know I don't know that it's taught any more differently is it just it's just more emphasized I think it's practiced more um, although both of my coaches that I had at Butler um, you know we shot quite a bit um, we shot quite a bit I know my first year with coach Gatlin she was all about transition transition offense and I could tell you I probably shot 
300, 400 transition threes every single day. Um, so I've always been a big advocate of pulling up for three in transition. Obviously, you watch my teams now, you, you see we shoot quite a few of those. So um, like you said, I don't think it's really taught too much different. I just think it's emphasized so much more in every single workout. Now, this past weekend was a big weekend for your alma mater. Butler Blue the third retired and made way for Butler Blue the fourth. But you were back on campus with Butler Blue, the original, uh, the OG. Do you have any memories of the original Butler Blue? Yeah, I do. I have memories of all of them, honestly. Um, I remember the original. I remember the second one, um, you know, going back. And then I remember the third when, when I was a head coach at Walsh. Um, we were lucky enough to go back to Butler for an exhibition game and um, actually ended up pulling that game out. It was a very bittersweet win. And um, Trippy, the guy, the, the, the guy, the dog that just retired, um, he wasn't there. And so I, I asked around and I said, I was really hoping Tripp would be here. And, and they called up um, his, his caretaker, uh, Michael, and, and he brought him right over, which was awesome. The whole team took pictures with him. My whole family took pictures with them. Uh, so for him to be retiring right now, very bittersweet. He's such a good boy. Um, the new one is is adorable. I'm sure he'll be just as loved and adored um, by everyone. But what Michael did with the mascot program there at Butler is, is really incredible. And um, there's so many schools that have mimicked um, what he's done since then. Now, from there, you mentioned it earlier, you had the opportunity to go play multiple sports overseas, uh, which, you know, everybody dreams about that. Like, oh, I'm going to go to college and play professionally. Really hard to do, though. Um, so what were some of those experiences like and, and having that opportunity? It was a great experience. Um, my senior year at Butler, I was ranked um, in the top 10 in the NCAA in three-point shooting. And having my name in those national rankings garnered some interest from teams overseas. And at the time, I was very burnt out. I had a rough senior year in terms of health and injuries, and um, which is why I didn't take my redshirt year. And so I wasn't really that interested. Um, you know, it was intriguing, but I was burnt out. I felt like I needed a break. So, and at the same time, I got a job offer. So I went right into the working world. My brother, who played professional baseball um, all over the world, happened to be in Italy um, that next year. And I went to see him. I was practicing with him. Um, just kind of out on the field with the team and the national team coach for the softball in Italy saw me uh, practicing and she said, you have to come here and play softball. Like, no. And I said, well, I can't. And she said, no, I'm serious. You, you have to come. And so after I was in the working world for about a year and a half, I finally agreed to go play. And while I was over there, I reached out to some of those teams that had contacted me to play basketball um, my senior year of college and to see if they were still interested. And thankfully they were. They just wanted to make sure I was still in shape. Um, and so I, I basically went home right after softball season for three weeks and went right back, right back for basketball. And that kind of started a spiral effect of, of being over in Italy for about five years playing both. And, and you mentioned before, never thought you'd get into coaching. So how do you go from playing professionally to now getting into coaching? Yeah, I mean, a couple things. Uh, on the basketball teams I played in in Italy, they kind of expected uh, as a part of our contracts the foreigners to, to help bring up the little kids. So we had to coach some of the, the younger teams in their organizations, which I found that, you know, it was fun. Um, obviously me being able to speak both languages, it helped. Um, but really what got me sparked was one of the years um, before finishing up overseas, I was looking for a job back in the States and um, I wasn't going to play basketball that year. Um, I'd hurt my back and I was just going to play one more year of softball. And so I got a job at a Division three school right outside of Fort Wayne, Manchester College at the time. It's Manchester University now. Um, and I was assistant softball, assistant basketball, and I had a million other jobs. I taught yoga class, everything. Just one of those small schools where you do what you can to make as much money as you can. And I think I made, with everything included, basketball, softball, yoga, I taught a wellness program. I think I made $11,000 total for <laughs> all of those. Um, well, I just fell in love with being on a college campus and I kind of saw right away that there was so much more to being a college coach than, than playing time. And while that is a huge piece, it was a small piece. And I, and I got a lot of satisfaction out of seeing the girls improve, building those relationships. And that's really when I fell in love with uh, being a coach. And I knew right then after coaching for that short time before I went back overseas, if that's what I wanted to do. Now, when you finally got into assistant coach uh, collegially, you were only there a couple of years. You rose up the ranks and you were immediate uh, head coach. 
um, Urbana and Walsh. Um, so how, how were you able to kind of rise up those ranks so quickly? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I took obviously a, a different path than most people in this profession. Starting out at Manchester, um, I was there. I started to realize this is what I was going to do and just kind of found out through the grapevine that Urbana had let their coach go mid-season. And I remember Coach Kucher reached out to me and she said, what do you think about this? Uh, we talked about it. She made a phone call and I still remember that day. She called me back. I was in the middle of a meeting and I had to step out to take it. And she's like, I think you're going to get an interview for that job. And I hadn't, you know, I only had two years of college coaching experience at the division three level as an assistant. Um, and so I was really excited. I went and interviewed right before Christmas. And then I started right after Christmas at Urbana, um, you know, had quite a bit of success right away. I don't think, you know, at that time, you know, I just remember some of the best advice I got was just teach what you know. Don't try and go crazy and teach things that you don't know. Just teach what you know. Um, get them to play really hard for you, and you're going to have a lot of success. And, and I think that was a, a great equation for, you know, not only at Urbana, but at Walsh as well. How, how important, not, not just in basketball, but just overall life, are those types of connections that, that you made? Coach Kucher makes one phone call and the path is, is set. So how, how important is it to, you know, make those types of, of connections with people? It's huge. I mean, just, you know, you don't want to burn your bridges. You want to be kind to everyone you meet. You never know who's going to be able to help you out along the way. I don't even know that she had any true connections there at the time, but just having her make that phone call was, you know, for me was huge. Um, having her recommendation, um, like you said, especially in this business, but really just in life, you, you want to, um, you know, make those connections and continue to build your network. Now, after uh, being the head, the head coach at those programs for a couple of years, you then went and became an associate head coach uh, at IUPUI. Was it difficult to kind of take that step back? It's ironic. I just did a, a podcast with Austin, who I worked for at IUPUI the other day, and we had a long conversation about this. Um, it was definitely a difficult decision. Obviously, it was a um, um, you're, you're losing kind of the authority. You're not in charge of making your own schedule anymore. You're not in charge of day-to-day -day things. Uh, for me, it was also a pretty big financial cut from where I was at at Walsh to being, you know, his assistant or associate head coach at IEPY. Uh, but for me, it was more about just building my resume, uh, becoming a better coach. I think that um, everyone wins in different ways, and I knew he was a defensive-minded coach, and I knew that I was the exact opposite, especially at the time of being a defensive-minded coach. So I was excited to see um, you know, how he taught the game, you know, how he ran his practices, just really how he ran his program. And for me, it was a little bit selfish in that, yes, it, you know, it was a tough decision, but I was doing it selfishly to, to help myself and help my own resume and um, kind of fill that void on my resume of not having coached Division I. Even though I had played Division I, I had never coached Division I. Uh, so that was the main factor that kind of uh, pushed me over the edge to take that job. And it helped lead to where you are now as the head women's basketball coach at Mount St. Mary's. Three seasons, you missed the postseason by just one game that first year and now back-to-back -back appearances in the semifinals the last two years. Um, how would you evaluate, I guess, the team's progress here over the, the three years that you've been at the helm? You know, I, every time you take over a program, you don't, you don't know how long it's going to take to kind of – for everything to click and kind of make that jump. And – um, this year, I thought I thought in our second year, we, we made that jump very late in the season. It finally clicked. We made that run. We had some success, like you mentioned. Exciting game at Robert Morris that we end up losing in the semis. Um, and then this year, I think the biggest thing was, you know, two factors. One, just a lot of players, the game finally slowed down for them. So their efficiency went up. The game slowed down, their efficiency went up. I mean, Bridget Burke had shot the lights out of the ball. You know, Jeterica's percentages went up in a lot of areas. Rebecca's have been high. Obviously, getting Kendall um, eligible and having her healthy was it was a huge, um, huge help as well. And then you know, Michaela having a year under her belt. You know, she's just so steady for us. She could do so much more, and she gave. She's so unselfish. She gave up so many shooting opportunities to get her teammates involved this year, um, and that was huge for us. So I think that was the first thing. The game just slowed down for a lot of kids, and then the second thing was we just made a huge jump defensively. We were just so much more fundamentally sound on the defensive end. Our ball screen coverages gave people some problems and we rebounded the ball better. So I just think, you know, as a whole, becoming, you know, more efficient offensively and just more fundamentally sound defensively helped us make that jump in the third year. 
Now, um, I'm sure you guys were, were disappointed that we didn't, we didn't get to play that, that semifinal game. I'm disappointed because I was really looking forward to calling. I mean, this, this game, when you look at the storyline perspective, had more sizzle than the fajitas at Chili's. I mean, just <laughs> both teams never being in the finals forever. Offense, defense, they had just beaten you the week before at your place. I mean, there, there was so much, you know, meat on the bone for this game. When you think back to that time period back in March and you put your mindset back at that time, um, in your mind, how are you kind of thinking that this game was going to play itself out? Uh, that's a tough question. I mean, I think, um, like you said, there was a lot of buildup. Um, you know, our, our goal throughout the season, especially after we went on that, that long run in, in mid-January through February, we go on that win streak, we really saw the, the regular season title in our sights. Um, and then we go to Robert Morris and we win that game. And then, then we lose to Robert Morris, you know, a couple weeks later at home. And so having to play Fairleigh Dickinson a couple of days after we knew that we had lost the regular season championship, we knew that that game wasn't going to affect our, our place in the tournament. It was just such a tough, tough game um, right around finals time, or I'm sorry, spring break time. So there wasn't a lot of people on campus, empty gym. I'm making excuses for our girls. We played terrible that day. Um, but that being said, to answer your question, I think that our kids were even more motivated for that Thursday semifinal game because they knew that they had let themselves down. They knew they didn't show up um, and play their best game. And give all the credit to, to Fairleigh Dickinson. Um, Lauren had the game of her life. I mean, she was phenomenal that game. Her The back and forth between her and Kendall and the game that we lost was, you know, if nothing else, fun to watch. Um, so I think the buildup for that game and the excitement to, to make up for the loss that we just had and honestly just get back to, or get to the finals and play Robert Morris again. We had a lot of motivation on the line in that game and we were excited to play it. Uh, we were excited to put that loss behind our back, the one that we had just, you know, a week earlier when we played them. So that only added to the disappointment, to be honest with you. You know, we, you know, we all saw the world and what was going on, but we really wanted to play that game. And, and it sucks that we didn't get the opportunity to do so. Yeah, no, nobody loves an unfinished book or like when you're watching a TV show and it gets to the end, it's to be continued. It's like, no, we want an ending, but to, right. you know, to, to not have that ending. Uh, but in a way, hopefully, hopefully we'll tune in next year and, and you know, there, there will be that ending next time. Um, you know, Mount St. Mary's has, has, and I'm sure you know, has a great history and tradition in itself as a program. Uh, when they came from D2 into D1, the late 80s, early 90s, they were powerhouse, won three championships in a row. Um, you know, and, and you guys have done such a great job recently. Uh, Susie Rolick, Vanessa Blair uh, retiring their numbers at halftime. But I'm just wondering, with today's players, how much – do you guys educate the players on that kind of history? And, and really, how much do they care about that kind of history? Because I'm sure players are, are more interested in making their own, their own history than hearing about what happened in 1990. Yeah, I think it's split. I think we have some kids on the team that are really interested in that stuff. And then some kids um, that are more interested, like you said, in just the here and now. Um, you know, whether they've wanted to learn about it or not, we've, we've tried to educate them. And I think um, the cool thing about improving over the last three years is as we've improved and we've broken some records, they've inadvertently learned about some of that history. Um, and, and it's always exciting when um, obviously you get like your 20th win and, and that's exciting, but it adds to the excitement when that hasn't been done in so long. So um, like you said, I think it's split. I think we have some girls that are really interested in that stuff. And, um, and then we have some kids that are just, just want to win right now, want to win for themselves and, and um, neither is wrong. Uh, but I just think we're a little bit split on that for sure. You know, you, you know, you go to a place like, you know, St. Francis U or Robert Morris, and, and they have the advantage to take the kids to the trophy case and be like, hey, look at all our championship trophies we have. And that, that history kind of speaks for itself. Um, but, you know, for your, for your team, we, we talked about it. You had the chance to, to get to the finals for the first time in forever and didn't really, wasn't able to happen. Um, so, but fortunately you bring, as you said at the beginning, your entire team back. That doesn't guarantee every, anything, but you bring the entire team back. So what has this process like, you know, moving on from that, going through this offseason unlike any other, and, and, and getting ready for the when and the if of, of wherever the next steps are? Yeah, I just think, you know, the one thing that it adds is, you know, we still haven't done anything. It was unfortunate. Right. It was unfortunate that we didn't get the opportunity. And I feel like if you ask anybody on our team, 
you know, they would have tell you that they would tell you that they, you know, we thought we were going to win it. But um, at the end of the day, we haven't done anything. We haven't proved ourselves on that level. Like you said, the, the Robert Morris's, the St. Francis PAs, they have a trophy trophy case full of all that stuff to look at. And we're trying to build our case. And as of right now, we, we haven't done any of that yet. So it just adds to the motivation um, that we're still working for that elusive championship. Obviously, we want to win the tournament championship and get to the tournament, um, but also that regular season championship. And um, it just puts a l- little bit more of a chip on our shoulder heading into this um, preseason. You know, just if looking back, let's say we did win it this past year and, and upset Robert Morris, which would have been a, you know, a tough, tough task you know, repeating is probably harder than doing it the first time. Sure. Um, but like I said, we, we still haven't proved anything. And, and um, if this virus and, and pandemic has done anything for us, it's kept uh, that chip on our shoulder to stay hungry. And what has the preparation been like for, for you and your staff? Um, you know, unprecedented times and off season, unlike any other, um, you know, eventually I'm sure you guys want to get back out recruiting and get the team in for workouts and all these things. But with the limitations that you have right now, what have you guys have, uh, been doing to kind of, you know, keep treading water here un- until things get back to somewhat normal? Sure. It's been, I mean, I just think like everyone else, we've been trying to utilize, you know, virtual uh, conversations, virtual talks. Obviously, everyone lives on Zoom these days. Yep. Um, our, our biggest, you know, thing as a staff that we've been worried about and or planning for right now is just if we don't get to have them back in July for workouts. Um, you know, if we don't get to have them back in July and workouts, we're going to have to start planning you know, more virtual things, more video time, especially to move those freshmen along. Because while we don't lose anybody, we add four freshmen to our mix. Um, So, you know, hopefully we do get the opportunity to have them back on campus, Um, you know, but if not, you know, what are we going to do in in that case? And so, um, you know, the time that over the last 10 to 12 weeks, what we've done is we've just tried to stay positive. You know, we we listened to a couple different speakers as as a staff at, at the Mount it said, you know, make sure you're, you know, not harping on workouts too much right now, especially early on. There's so much more important things. Just make, help them stay positive, help them stay active. And I think that's the biggest thing we've tried to do, at least until recently. Now, now we're into June and we're looking at July. Now we're, we're, we're focused more on getting those workouts in and building our conditioning back up. But for the last 10 to 12 weeks, it's been um, more about staying positive, work on your academics, enjoy your family time, just, you know, take advantage of, of what we're going through and, and pull the positives from it. And what are your, I mean, I'm not sure if Mount made any announcements as far as fall uh, for, for the students, but what, what are you here? You think there's a good chance that you guys get back in July? I think there's a good chance we get to have our workouts in July. Um, I'm not, it's definitely not a hundred percent sure yet. Basically, you know, as, as a university, our president has said we are going to open up in the fall, um, whether we start early or late or whatever. Those things haven't been worked out yet. But since we are going to be working, you know, opening up in the, in the fall, um, one of the things that's been nice to talk to them about is possibly starting some of our new protocols with the men's and women's basketball teams on campus. Um, obviously, nothing's going to be the same, especially this year. There's going to be so many um, new procedures and protocols in place. So one of the benefits of allowing us to be on campus to work out would be to to practice some of those new protocols and procedures. So that's something that we're talking about right now with our administration. Like I said, it's not, not final by any means, but it's looking more and more like it might happen. So I have some random questions here to throw at you. And and the the first one, if you could, if we gave you the power to change one NCAA rule and they came to you and said, Maria, you could change it could be a gameplay rule, a recruiting rule, a scheduling rule, any one rule to either change it or add it. What would be the one rule that, that you would amend? You know, I think I would go back to the six timeouts. I, I, I stress over those now, and especially with us being able to advance the ball, those timeouts become even more precious. Um, even if it, if it was the old, you know, use it or lose it, you know, we don't have that in our game anymore. It took that time out. I think I would rather have it that way, go back to the six timeouts. Uh, having those two full and four thirties was just wonderful. I missed that. Um, yeah, it's a small thing, but you know, I don't really have any huge complaints um, about the rules. You know, I think a lot of coaches would agree. It's not necessarily the rules. It's just how it's called. Um, you know, the inconsistency of um, trying to, you know, I think Charlie said it best in a post game interview is, our kids have to adapt every single game to how that game is being called. And it's a challenge. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't really have any true complaints on, on what rules we have in place. Just, um, you know, hoping that it's called the same way every game is something we have to obviously deal with. Now, if we, 
had you come up with the Mount Rushmore of Indiana basketball? You, you obviously have Bob Knight on there, probably Reggie Miller. Uh, you probably throw Larry Bird on there, Larry Legend. Who, who would that fourth person be? Damon Bailey. Really? Why? I mean, in Indiana, he's, he's king in terms of high school basketball. Um, you know, there's been a lot of good ones that have gone through. I mean, Deshaun Thomas went to Ohio State. James Blackman went to IU. We've had some really good ones um, since then. Yeah, but, John, John Wooden played uh, high school ball yeah, in Indiana, I believe. Yeah, that was a while back. I mean, <laughs> he's not even talked about as much in terms of a player, obviously, his coaching days. But, um, yeah, I think most people would say Damon in their top four, hands down. Obviously, Gene Cady, Bob Knight. Um, like you said, Larry Bird, and you're kind of all over the place with college and pros and whatnot. But in terms of Indiana high school basketball, Damon Bailey is still at the top of most people's lists. Now, when, when all this is over and the world opens up for real and, 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 and you know, whenever that is, where is the first place that you're going? And it can't be to the basketball gym. You have to pick someplace else. Uh, I think my husband and I would love to just go out to a Mexican restaurant. You know, we're missing that. That was something we did pretty often. Either that or we'd go out for breakfast. I, you know, back in Indiana, a lot of things are opening back up. Here in Maryland, restaurants you still can't go to and eat at. Um, you know, I'm a shopper, so hitting up the outlet malls will be fun <laughs> once those open back up. But, yeah, just the little things, just going out to eat, I think, is one of the first things we'll do. Uh, I'm sure that you probably, I'm guessing, watched more TV or more Netflix now this uh, these last couple months than you would have normally in April, May, and June. Um, so, so what have you been binging? What have you been enjoying during this time? I'm not a TV person at all. I mean, usually if the TV's on, it's sports. So the last, you know, two to three months have been um, an adjustment for me. Um, we have watched quite, quite a bit. We, early on, we were into Blacklist, All-American, Ozarks. Um, eventually we watched um, Longmire, uh, Money Heist, uh, Dead to Me. There's so many. Um, I'm about at my limit of TV <laughs> for sure. Um, but there are some good ones, I will say. For not being a TV person, I enjoyed some of them. Well, hopefully we'll start getting some sports back, so at least yes. there, there might be some sports on pretty soon, uh, which is certainly a good sign. And, and, and let's finish up with this. You know, we've talked a lot about Mount St. Mary's and the program, and, and you know, there was a lot of anticipation and excitement coming into this season, and I, that'll probably continue into next season as well. So uh, looking forward, you know, what, what's the, the state of the program, and, and, and what do you think this team will need to do to take that next step and get to that championship game and win it next time around? Yeah, I think I, I've touched on it a couple times. I just think our girls have to stay hungry and stay motivated, you know. Um, the season is so long. It's so long in terms of, you know, we start training in July. Um, you know, we go through, we get to school, we pretty much start, you know, with all the rule changes, we have some sort of practices almost immediately. Um, and then, you know, practice starts, official practice starts in September anymore, which is earlier than it ever was. And we don't finish until, you know, if you have a good season, mid to late March. Um, so I just think for us, it's going to be consistency, showing up every single day to put in the work. Um, leaving it all on the floor, not coasting, not complaining about our legs or, or whatever, but making the most of every single day. I think that we have, like you've mentioned, you know, enough people coming back, enough talent on our roster, on our roster that, you know, we should have a decent season. But whether it's a decent season or a great season is going to come down to our consistency with our practices and putting in the work every single day. Well, we look forward to hopefully seeing you and your team back on the court uh, this, this fall, winter, uh, making that, that March to March. So, uh, you know, we wish you the best of luck and certainly all the, the, the health in the world here during these times. And, and thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, for sure. It was fun. Thanks for having me, Craig. And, and, and by the way, you know, if, for those that don't know, we had this little thing where every time I spoke with Maria and announced one of her games, they always lost, but we got that out of the way up at St. Francis earlier this winter. So <laughs> now, yeah, so now you don't have to lock the gym. Now, now I, we can continue to chat. So I, I certainly appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I was happy to get that one out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, thank you to Maria Marcusato. I'm Craig D'Amico, and this has been NEC Now on the NEC Overtime Pod. Yeah.